now for the second leg of the Better. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second show of the day of the Mike New Haven podcast. If you haven't checked out the previous episode, which was 150 milestone episode, uh, my next guest, you probably know who this is, and that's Alice Gaynor from Channel 2, WCBS New York, Emmy Award winning and Emmy nominated anchor and reporter. Uh, Alice was great, really nice person. That was cool because I've been working on getting her on this show for like five years, and she was finally here today. And it delivered. So I enjoyed talking with Alice immensely. And Alice, if you watched this episode, thank you again for coming on. You were a blast to talk to. So tonight, tonight, me and my next guest gain our revenge over technology. You know, because the first time he was on, I felt horrible because he's such an interesting guy. But the episode was a piece of crap, not because of anything he did or I did, but because back then when I was still using Zoom for this show, it was a nightmare. And for the fine folks at One Police Plaza, if you could fix the Wi-Fi, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> So I said to him, you know, the other day, I have to get you back on. We have to do this again because it's not fair to you nor to the audience uh, that uh, they get shortchanged for. Well, it's a really good guest. And who is he? Well, he's covered crime in the police department, the New York City Police Department, that is, uh, for over three decades now. A veteran with stops the New York Daily News, where he's currently at, New York News Day, the since defunct New York News Day, that is. Uh, and, of course, the New York Post. He's been the Daily News Bureau Chief covering the police department there since 2009. He's written a book, too, and that's called Guns and God, The Life of an NYPD undercover uh, which came out back in 2016 and that's covering of course detective former detective and a uh, former marine steven stevie gun striker and that returning as we get our revenge on bad technology tonight rocco paris candola thanks for doing this again rocco appreciate it hello mike good to have you again so as we covered before and we'll, we'll redo everything tonight and add some new tidbits in there too brooklyn kid take me through it say it again Brooklyn kid, you grew up in you grew up in Brooklyn. Take me to. I still live in Brooklyn, from Brooklyn originally, and yes, I'm still here. Um, it's my family's home, and I guess it'll always be home for me. Mm -hmm. So, I did you mention this the first time we spoke? I believe you grew up right by where they where the post is, uh, Brooklyn headquarters, where the trucks would be moving the newspapers, and you mentioned that serving as an inspiration. I believe. No, I, I grew up. Uh, I grew up in 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 Bensonhurst. My family later moved to uh, to Garrison Beach on the uh, six or seven miles away. Um, I do remember as a kid, whenever I was downtown, driving past uh, one of the Brooklyn garages for the Daily News, and this was at a time where um, you know I knew I wanted to become a reporter. I always thought it was cool to see the papers being uh, loaded up on the truck or the trucks returning after making the uh, the morning runs. Um, and it was something I got to see when I, you know, when I later went to work for the post. Mm. And, you know, it's interesting back then crime reporters, we had, well, they didn't do exclusively crime, but whenever they did, they did just fine covering it. There was Jimmy Breslin who had a notorious interaction with the son of Sam killer, uh, you know, which was, uh, the stuff of legend. There was Pete Hamill when he would dip his toe into covering crime, did okay with that. Dick Young was primarily a sports writer, but same thing. Uh, so we had great writers back then covering that because it was part of daily life in New York city. And since there's so much of a, you know, within a melting pot containing 8 million people, you get naturally great stories regarding not only the, the perception of crime, but also how it's fought, the evolution of criminals, how they're taken down, organized crime, street crime, you name it. So if you can credit any early columnist, if any, who would you say inspired you early on for their coverage of crime? Well, certainly growing up reading the news, and the news was the only paper uh, in my family's uh, home, my parents' home, still is actually. Um, you know, I essentially grew, grew up reading Jimmy Breslin's columns. I read other columns as I got older, the Hamill brothers, Jack Newfield, um, Jim Dwyer, a bunch of others. Uh, but it was Breslin at the news uh, who I grew up reading, uh, and I still, you know, the crime that still resonates the most with me, the, the, the crime that I can remember uh, first remembering, I guess, or first reading a lot about was, in fact, the Son of Sam case, um, you know, which Jimmy broke a lot of stories on because he was he was getting letters from the Son of, from the son of Sam. Yeah. So I guess he would be my biggest inspiration. I later got to work with him at Newsday, and it was, uh, you know, it was a great honor. I learned a lot from him. He wasn't, he wasn't preachy. You just learned uh, talking to him, and I had a column for a while at Newsday. Uh, which he edited, or I sent to him to read before I even sent to my editors, and he would always make recommendations that almost always helped, the, if not always, helped the column for sure. So I, I guess it would be, of all the columnists, it would be him more than anyone else, although I later learned, uh, particularly from Pete Hamill working with him uh, at the Post, uh, we worked with a couple other reporters on a project in the early 90s 
that he sort of chaired. It was about a, a major international banking scandal that had New York connections and New York roots. And he took a very complicated um, controversy uh, and localized it and made it like, a sh you know, a shooting in Brooklyn, basically. I mean, in the end, it's who, what, when, where, why, and how, right? The names right. change, the locations change, but that's what it's about. The KISS method, keep it simple, stupid. Sure, absolutely. You know, so it's and it's interesting because our mutual friend Mike Lupica was on the show a while ago, and, and Mike mentioned something great about being in the newsroom back when the Daily News had that great newsroom downtown Manhattan, where Breslin and Hamill would be right down the hallway, and it's like you could see the magic in the air as the two of them would type their stories on whatever the subject matter was. You know, and you have to consider yourself, you being, of course, uh, that I'm referring to, um, very fortunate to have worked with those two because. There's quintessential New York reporters, as I talked about earlier with Alice Gaynor. There's quintessential New York writers. Those two were quintessential New York writers. And let me tell you something, man, and no offense to those who are out there. Now they do great work. They're, the guys like that, the writers like that, period, they're just not around anymore. No, I mean, it's the you know the time of the big-name columnists is, is gone. You know, we the, the finances of uh, the newspaper business have changed dramatically, and there's, there's really no money left to pay these big-name columnists. And, and for a while, and this was before I was in the business, the news had Hamill and Breslin at the same time. You get one on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, the other Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. And if you were a newspaper reader, that was, uh, you know, that was heaven on earth, basically. Yeah. And you went to Long Island University, LIU. Uh, you furthered uh, your studies there. And, of course, in college, it's, it's different because there's a chance to, if there's a college newspaper there, you can participate in that and hone your skills further. There's the opportunity to get out in the field now with the advent of technology being as prevalent as it is. I mean, you have college newspapers breaking major stories. It's amazing sure. how far it's come. But for you at that time, it's almost like a journalistic boot camp. What would you say was the most pivotal thing you learned at LIU? You know, we had a, uh, I was on the school paper beginning the end of my freshman year. I was sports editor my sophomore year and then editor-in-chief junior year as a senior i was a news editor i was working an internship then so i kind of stepped back from the you know the lead role uh but we had a um early on our first faculty advisor for the paper mm -hmm. it was called siwanaka which meant long island in in indian mm -hmm. uh dialect of indian uh Cowan siegel uh now deceased uh long time new york times uh, editor, reporter and editor. I think his, his last position at the Times was the editor of the letters page. Believe it or not, they actually had an editor. And he was our faculty advisor. And he would, you know, he would advise us. You know, we would go see him once a week. I'd go see him once a week, tell him the stories we were working on. And um, <clears throat> and we would always, I would always learn from him. You know, we were all full of uh, vim and vigor. We thought we knew everything, but he made sure to bring us down a peg to tell us, you know, there's, there's two sides to every story, and then there's probably two more you're not even thinking about. And uh, to this day, I remember him saying, when in doubt, leave it out. It's so simple, right? But, I mean, this is how journalists get in trouble sometimes. They they kind of stretch it a little bit, or they put something in and they aren't quite sure about or isn't properly sourced. And before you know it, they're writing a correction or the story is slanted in a way that they didn't mean it. But he kept things very simple. Um, and I, we, I, I learned a lot from him. I felt like my... Uh, you know, my, my fellow students who work for the paper also learned a lot from him. So he was, uh, he was, um, he set us on the right path, I believe. Rocco Paraskindola, New York Daily News Police Bureau Chief is our guest tonight on the Mike the New Haven podcast. I want to shout out to our friends in the live chat. And like I always like to say, if you have a question for Rocco or myself, type it away. Don't be shy and I'll make sure he sees it. So good evening to Alicia B, Maui Swift, Dawn Marie. I see Ruth Ann Griffin here, of course, Joe Connor, uh, tuning in via LinkedIn. Thank you, Joe, for being here. He's the author, of, uh, co-author of the book, Shattered Lives. His father, unfortunately, was killed in the infamous 1975 Francis Tavern bombing. And Joe has been very active in uh, talking about counterterrorism matters ever since. Bill Ryan, retired NYPD first grade detective from the Arson Explosion Squad and the co-creator and co-executive producer of the miniseries that we have on this show. Tales from the Boom Room profiles the NYPD's arson explosion bomb squads here as well. And Raquel Apranzo is here as well. Thank you guys for being here tonight. So you get to the New York Post as a really young guy in 1989. And uh, this is another iconic paper, uh, one that has, you know, it's it's still veeing at this time with uh, the Daily News for a firm grip on the city. So you walk into that newsroom as a young kid. Now, there's two different kinds of young people walking into a newsroom. There's one with the very exuberant confidence, you kind of talked about, you know, your professor telling you to, to watch it and, and the students, not in a bad way, not that you guys are egotistical, but come down a notch, you know, and there's some young people that because they're young and inexperienced don't understand that. 
And there's the other ones that walk in really intimidated, really shy, just honored to be there. Which one were you? Probably a combination of both. I think I was probably more overwhelmed than anything else. I mean, it was a great opportunity. I wasn't even 24 years old. I was at a weekly in Brooklyn. Uh, this was at a time when the Post was starting up its Sunday paper for the first time. And I heard from a colleague of mine at this weekly who had, who had a tryout for the Sunday paper but didn't get it. He said, hey, they're giving tryouts. Why don't you give it a shot? And uh, I was ultimately able to get the tryout and latch on eventually. And even after that version of the Sunday paper, uh, closed. It only lasted uh, 10 months or so before it closed out for, it just wasn't doing well. It it, it, uh, it didn't have coupons in it, et cetera. So I was worried that being hired for the Sunday paper, I now would be let go since there was no more Sunday paper, but I stayed on and Sunday paper eventually came back a year or so later. Um, and I get there and it's, it's, it's overwhelming. Um, but fortunately there were a lot of veteran people there, uh, a lot. It was easily the youngest, uh, me, maybe one other person seemed like everyone was in their 40s, 50s, or 60s, and you just learn from them. And so as a runner, which is what we call the young reporters who just run on stories uh, and then call in notes to rewrite people, um, it was easy to learn from them because if you didn't get something that they needed for the story, they t would tell you to go back and ask the person, to, you know, get the, get the answer that you, um, that you needed. If, uh, if you needed to go to another scene and you didn't realize it, they would tell you, go here now and get this. And so it was easy to learn from them. Um, and I didn't get to write a lot in the beginning, which is typical of most runners, but when you would open up the paper the next day, you'd, I would quickly read through it. Then I would read the competition in that case, primarily the news and see what they had that we didn't have, see what we had that they didn't have and wonder why that was the case. Was it something I did right? Was it something I did wrong? Was it something, was it just a matter of luck? Um, and so with that, I became more confident. You get to know the city more. You're in neighborhoods you otherwise wouldn't be. You know where every precinct is. You know where the EMS stations are. You know how to get from the east side to the west side real quick in rush hour, during rush hour. You know, all little tricks of the trade that you're only going to learn by actually going out uh, and doing it. And it was a time when there was less official them, so to speak. Like you could still walk into a precinct um, at 10 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, I'm with the post. I'm looking to talk to the case detective on the shooting from last night, or is the precinct commander around? And invariably they, you know, come out and talk to you. It wouldn't be on the record necessarily, but they would provide guidance that would begin, you know, would set you on your way to reporting that day's story. Um, that doesn't really exist now, but back then it was, it was distinctly possible. The crime beat was interesting because your first real, real stint with it was 1989 to 1993, because back then, and I don't think we touched on this the first time you were here. And this is why I'm glad we're redoing this now. You had not one, not two, but three different police departments. So housing crime, talk to the housing police. Transit crime, talk to the transit police. Anything else, the NYPD. Mm -hmm. Was it harder then because of the three separate police departments to cover crime? I mean, it was a little unwieldy. It was. It definitely was a little unwieldy. Um, but we managed to make it work. And, and usually the way it worked with the major crimes, the major homicides, the NYPD would kind of, would kind of uh, run it in a lot of ways anyway, run the investigation in a lot of ways anyway. Uh, and then um, for a short while after running, I was transit reporter and it was still pre-merge. Um, and so I got to cover transit as a beat, which is a great beat, but also the transit police department. So I got to know that department more intimately than I otherwise might have. And then ultimately, shortly thereafter, that housing, that and housing merged with the NYPD. And that, of course, was in 1990. So long ago, Eric Adams was a transit officer. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, well, I think Jimmy O'Neill told me this a few years ago when he was on, when he was still the active NYPD commissioner. I think transit went first and then housing went in like May of 95. If I, yeah, had I, time that's, I, I think you got it right. That's correct, I believe. Yes. So when you were at, I don't, well, he wasn't the chief where you were there. It was somebody else by this point. But Bill Bratton and Jack Mabel had made their mark on the transit police. And Bill, at this time in 93, when you first got to the transit beat, was over in Boston serving as their police commissioner. And then he came into the city as and the NYPD commissioner in 94. Uh, but his imprint and Maple's imprint, too, was still firmly there. So getting up close with the transit cops, what are some of the more notable interactions you can recall for them with them? Because everybody remembers the cops above ground. But I feel like they're very underrated because they had an even tougher job, arguably, trying to patrol in this myriad of people you know, that are together, it packed in like sardines underground. 
yeah, it's always been under recognized. I mean, it's a very the subway is a very unnatural environment. We live above ground, so here you have a world underground, and um, and uh, the subway sort of connects everybody. Everyone everyone can relate to the subway. Millions of New Yorkers take it a day, and uh, a crime on the subway in some ways just resonated, and still to this day resonates a lot more than a than a crime above ground in a, in a lot of cases. So if a crime happens on the A train. It doesn't much matter if you take the A train from Inwood to Midtown or from the Rockaways to downtown Brooklyn. If a crime happens on the A line, somewhere in between, it's still going to resonate with you. You still think, wow, that could have been me. Um, and that I don't know that that exists necessarily with a crime above ground, the crime that occurs in a particular neighborhood. And let's say it involves a bad guy and a bad guy. You say to yourself, well, I'm not a bad guy. I don't live in that neighborhood. It's not going to affect me. It's different with the subway system. And I, it was it was like that then, and I believe it's it's like that today as well. Yeah, because, I mean, some of my NYPD friends would refer to it, like, let's say, you know, there's gangs beefing and one uh, criminal kills another criminal. All right, it's still unfortunate that it led to these uh, to this situation because everybody loses here. Both families lose. But what they would call it is a public service homicide because, hey, they're cleaning, they're cleaning each other out, criminals killing criminals. But as you said, when it's something like that, like what happened to that poor woman, Michelle Go, who did not deserve that at all, shoved in front of a train, everybody stopped doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on necessarily and your view and perception of crime everybody stopped and naturally got a lot of attention because there she was doing what so many new yorkers do every day just trying to get from one place to the other and she gets up ends up getting killed for no reason at all yeah yeah the total the total innocent syndrome of someone who's totally innocent minding their own business yeah. and and this happens to them and and, and so even if you were to look at a, a crime involving two drug dealers and you're like okay i don't deal drugs i have nothing to worry about a lot of times those guys miss and a stray bullet strikes yep. and kills a kid or a grandmother or a mother pushing a stroller. And that's when it really resonates. That's when real that's when people really get afraid because then it doesn't matter if you're in a safe neighborhood necessarily, or even if you live in a dangerous neighborhood, but you generally mind your business. You could be victimized, you know, walking to school, sending your kid to go to the store to pick up some milk, whatever the case might be. Yep. So you spent some time before we get to the primary beat in 1996 of getting to one police plaza during a very interesting time for the NYPD. You spent some time covering federal court. Now, federal court in New York is interesting because they were handling indictments really from overseas. Osama bin Laden, as an example, was indicted for his role in the Cobar Towers bombing and the embassy bombings in 1998 in a New York federal court. So you're not just getting the local crimes. Let's say the mob is on trial. Of course, it's there. You're getting international crime, too. What are some of the more notable cases you can recall covering during that relatively brief stint? Sure. I, I was only there about six months. I was actually I was actually there just before joining the police beat. Uh, but it was an interesting time. And what I got to cover was the very first terror trial, which was the, the, the blind shake and his uh, his protégés who were responsible for the first World Trade Center bombing. Uh, and that was fascinating. I mean, that happened on New York soil, but obviously it had tentacles. It had tentacles around the world. It had a firebrand uh, lawyer in Lynn Stewart representing the Sheikh and other big name attorneys. Uh, and it had sort of America's first look at terrorism on on our on our soil or terrorism by foreign parties on, on our soil. I mean, certainly we've had domestic terrorism. Uh, and there were some other cases, too, particularly financial cases that had connections to overseas, if not uh, started overseas. And uh, it wasn't always easy, but a lot of times the U.S. attorneys would argue for New York jurisdiction. And even Morgendow, then the Manhattan District Attorney, uh, was successful in, in prosecuting some financial crimes that had all these tentacles around the world, prosecuting them in, 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 in Manhattan. So, um, yeah, you think you're in Manhattan, you're covering just something that's local, but it's really, it has these worldwide connections. And plus, because it's in New York, everyone is watching anyway. So you mm -hmm. sort of feel like it's the big stage. I remember being uh, down in the city with one of my friends from the bomb squad back in October. And I asked him, I said, you know, and I said, I know this sounds like a silly question, but why do they choose New York to send their message? And to paraphrase him, what he told me was because everybody's going to hear it. It's not going to hit the same if you do it in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's not going to hit the same if you do it even in a place like Washington, D.C. This is the crossroads of the world. This is me, Matt, adding my own words now. So naturally, you know, if you do it here, everybody sees you know, it's the ultimate billboard, whatever message you want to get out, but certainly a dangerous message like that one. New York is the place, unfortunately, to go. It attracts both positive and negative. Yeah, no, that's true. Although that that dynamic is, has actually changed as we've moved away from 
and I guess as the government, as our gov, as our government has done a good job of preventing another 9/11 style attack, what we see now is uh, we see these uh, homegrown terrorists, these lone wolves, yeah. um, these terrorist incidents in small towns, San Bernardino, mm -hmm. uh, workplace shootings, whatnot shopping malls in the middle of nowhere why because in some ways it's even scarier because it used to be you said to yourself all right i don't live in new york i don't live in la i'm not in chicago or miami or boston i'm okay um but if you wake up and there's a terrorist attack in some small town even if the damage isn't what we saw on 9 11 even if the the bloodshed is limited to even single digit fatalities it really scares people because now it's like, well, okay, I'm in small town America. Now I, now I have to worry. It's not just about being in the big city. I don't just have to worry, you know, when my kid spends a, you know, goes to college in New York or goes on vacation in New York. Now I have to worry just walking down the street in small town America that there could be some terrorist attack here. So, so that dynamic has actually changed a little bit. Yep, yeah, unfortunately, and it's a sign of the times, very much so. Rocco Paris Gandola is our guest tonight on the Mike Dinwaven podcast, New York Daily News Police Bureau Chief. And in that vein, we go to 1996, because when you got there, Bill Bratton, very friendly, very media friendly, as you know, and you covered him the second time he was commissioner, does not mind talking to the press. John Miller, who was his DCPI, both for part one as commissioner and part two, he was a reporter himself, and he was a police reporter, so he knew where you guys were coming from. They didn't have problems at all with the media. Howard Safer and Marilyn Mode did. Marilyn Mode was not particularly nice from what I've heard. And Howard Safer, as you told me the first time you were on, he had the face, and this is a line that we're borrowing from our, our late friend, Lenny Levitt, the face of a man who had uh, perpetually bitten into a sour lemon or something to that effect. So That's exactly what he said in his book, yes. Yep. They're very gruff individuals, especially Mode, who was the DCPI and really gave you guys a hard time. Being there, how would you describe covering safer era nypd well, well generally the, the, the dcbi sort of takes on the personality of of the commissioner i think and 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 does what the commissioner wants done puts out what the commissioner wants out uh how it's safer was uh you know aside from his stint as fire commissioner he was a career fed he was a federal agent and the, and the feds as you know pl are much closer to the vest in terms of yeah. information in terms of uh i mean they just they're they're governed by different guidelines when it, when it comes to talking to the press and you know old habits are difficult uh, uh to change uh at the same time he's also appointed by rudy giuliani who as mayor was you know wanted to be the top dog wanted to be the the one who spoke no matter no matter what agency was involved so for reporters, that was a bit of a recipe for disaster. I mean, obviously, Giuliani was always around, and so he was always available to answer questions. But on the day-to-day -day stuff, the ordinary things, whether it was a, a, you know, whether it was the murder of the day, the fire of the day, uh, an issue in homeless services that wasn't necessarily front-page news but was important to the person covering that beat, it was difficult to get information because everything had to be funneled through city hall and spun by city hall and as you know there's only so many hours in a day and sometimes yeah. stories would just die on the vine basically or they would be less complete than than they otherwise would be this was a and, I, and I think marilyn mode I, you know kind of re i think i think marilyn mode reflected that you know she she would put out or not put out uh you know whatever safe wanted out or didn't want or the cops used to joke whatever the mayor wanted out or didn't want no, of course. So, I mean, that that segues into, I guess, some of the stories that occurred during that era. I mean, 96 to 2000, this was a particularly deadly and dangerous time for the police. I mean, eight cops between 1996 and 1998 were shot and killed in the line of duty. I'm not counting those that died in auto accidents or, or Vinnie Judice, who was assaulted and, and, and bled to death as a result of getting cut on the mirror. So eight of them were shot. And then, of course, on the other uh, side of the coin, there's the Luima incident. There's the Diallo incident. There's the Doris Mon incident. So these are very charged situations, and people are naturally flocking to the papers, even still when it happens today, they're flocking to the papers to read a definitive account. But you have to walk that line in getting the facts, but not letting whatever rhetoric is coming from either side affect the column. How difficult a line was that to walk for you? It, it, it's, it's, it wasn't easy then, and it's, it's not easy now. I mean, there is... Um... You know, uh, there's always been spin and there's always been exaggeration. Um, and often people who are telling you things have political agendas in mind. 
and, and so it's not easy. Uh, and even if you're covering a story that has legs where you're going to be writing about it for quite a while, and theoretically you have the opportunity tomorrow to come at it from a different angle, you're still on that day, whatever story you're doing that day, it's got to be, it's got to be as balanced as possible. Um, you know, what doesn't help is when it's hard to get official information. It's one thing to get it from sources, but you know, sometimes your sources can be wrong. Your sources are well-intentioned, but they're not necessarily involved in the investigation or hearing something from someone else. So it's always, particularly on the big stories, it's important to have the people running the show, the people running these agencies, you know, to talk openly about it. And, and I get sometimes, you know, they want to keep information uh, close to the vest. If it's an ongoing investigation, sometimes it's just not sure. Yeah. Sometimes the people aren't talking, you know, everyone has the right to, to not talk to police, the police themselves. If they're accused, they don't, they have the right to not, to not talk to investigators. Right. So it, it, it becomes difficult. And you often, you know, the old saying is you kind of have to write around it. You, you, you write what you know, and maybe the best way to write a story like that is to write what you don't know. Say it's it's still this is still not clear A B C D and E, and there's no harm in that necessarily because the reader might be must might be asking well, what about that. So if you say it and you explain why it's not yet clear, I, I I think you best serve the reader. You don't always have the space to do it all, but you try your best. I mentioned the amount of police officers who were killed in line of duty duty during this time, and then you were just at the funerals for detectives uh, Jason Rivera and Wilbert Moore a few weeks ago. Right. And it doesn't matter what background the officers originally from, these two gentlemen in particular were Dominican, Italian, white, whatever. The sacrifice is the same. And certainly that goes to the New York City Fire Department as well. To be at these funerals, this is a two-part question. Do you remember your first cop funeral and who was for specifically A and B when you're there? You're a human being. You know, that's where you take your reporter hat off and you're observing this solemn ceremony. You're observing the family and the colleagues of these officers that are killed. How emotional experience is that? And how difficult is it to keep those emotions in check? You know, I actually, I actually, I actually don't remember my first one. I think it actually might have been uh, before I was at the post when I was working for a weekly in Brooklyn. Uh, we had two officers killed the same night in different parts of the city, uh, wow. Busek and, and Holbin. Uh, Holbin. And I believe I was at Holbin's funeral. Uh, and generally speaking, the media doesn't typically get into the funeral. They usually ask that we stay outside. Sometimes the families don't mind. Uh, and more recently, with technology, we're able to listen and sometimes see on screen set up outside what's going on inside. And in a lot of ways, it's actually there's something about being outside in that sea of blue. Um, you know, talking to officers. You know, once uh, once the body is brought in, uh, including officers who come from other cities, other states, other countries, even. And just people on the street who live in the area, work in the area, or just come because they want to see it. It's uh, it's it's interesting to talk to those people. It's an impressive, it's an impressive show, so to speak. I mean, you have this, the sea of blue, you have the sea of grief, basically. And uh, and if you if you're able to listen to the speeches as we were for the funerals of Rivera and Mora, uh, it's powerful stuff. I mean, particularly a Rivera's wife. I mean, I think what struck people about this incident is that these are two officers so young, 27 for Mora and 22 for Rivera. And he's got a young bride. They were only married a few months. And she gets up there, you know, and uh, in a very poised way, uh, laments the loss of her husband and uh, takes sharp aim at Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg, who earlier in the, well, it was in the month, early in January, uh, made headlines, what is, what is pronounced with that certain crimes were uh, not going to be prosecuted the way they had been in the past, particularly um robberies involved a robbery a robbery involving a weapon um and so to call out the manhattan da who's in the audience at a funeral and then get a standing ovation from it i mean that's a that's that's a widow's speech you don't get at every single police funeral so it was it was powerful stuff back to your career february of 2001 you go off to New York News Day. Now, what's interesting about that, as I mentioned, Lenny earlier, he's there and he's been there a while. And he, he was coming off a really hard time. Safer gave him the hardest time of all, as you know. But sure. now Bernie Carrick's there. And Bernie Carrick's a lot. Say what you will about him now. But, you know, he's, he, he was a lot easier to deal with back then. Much more mellow guy and more approachable than his predecessor was. But nonetheless, being there, Lenny didn't strike me as the kind of guy to feel threatened. Uh, so, you know, he didn't strike me as the kind of guy to have ego. He liked what he did. He didn't take himself too seriously. So getting to Newsday and working with him, uh, tell me about what it was like being in his presence. 
Yeah, I mean, I got to know him a little bit um, when I was at the post. Uh, you know, for those not familiar with it, the, the press room at police headquarters, well, it's been moved to another part of the second floor. But then it was uh, it was on the opposite side of the second floor, and the, the post was right next to Newsday. Uh, and Lenny was uh, Lenny was friends with Murray Weiss, who was the bureau chief of the Post at the time. He's now with CBS Television, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they were always talking. Two veterans who've been around forever, and you know I got to know Lenny that way. Um, and then I got to work basically to sit next to him, and he did his own thing. He was he did his column, and me and the three other reporters who were signed there, you know, we did, we did the daily reporting. But what I learned from him is just uh, you know he had a fearlessness about him. Um, he, you know, he, he, he didn't play favorites. At least I, didn't, I don't believe so. Uh, he went after the sacred cows in in a way that a columnist could, but a reporter necessarily couldn't. And he never, he never backed down. I mean, he never backed down. And he didn't brag about it. He just did it. And you, I did learn a lot about him. And I guess the, the primary lesson is. You know, these people put their pants on one leg at a time, just like we do. You know, they, they, they're flawed people uh, who make mistakes, and sometimes unintentionally and sometimes maliciously and in a, in a corrupt way, whether it's the police department or, you know, the Department of Aging. Uh, people who have power, uh, if left unchecked, um, um, will run amok in some cases. And, uh, and Lenny was always uh, diligent about pointing that out and, and not just – you know, in one column, there were cases that kind of had legs and he would come back to the same incidents again and again and again over the space of months, sometimes even more than a year yeah. uh, until, until it was, until he got an answer basically, or until, you know, until the case was adjudicated. So I did, I did learn a, a hell of a lot uh, from him. Yes. And it was funny. I used to love because he had a great sense of humor, very dry sense of humor, as it struck me when I read his columns. Because every at the end of the year, he would write that joke column. You probably know what I'm talking about. Police commissioner, insert whoever the commissioner was at the time, walks down Fifth Avenue to see how many people recognize him. You right. know, it, it it was he. So he he mixed it up. He had a great serious sense of what he did, but he also knew how to inculcate the humor too. And his readers definitely, and I was one of them. I definitely love that. And I speak for all his readers, I think, and all his colleagues, you included, when I say we miss that. Because Le especially now, Lenny would be amazing right now. Oh, he, he would be having a field day, and it really is – there's no one to replace him. I mean, like I said, the days of these columnists, they're gone. And, yeah. uh, you know, he was one of a kind, and and I don't think – you know, we're not going to see another one like him for sure. And and you mentioned that, that column, the year-end walk down Fifth Avenue. I like <laughs> – probably thousands of other people first time i read it i actually thought this was happening when in fact it was it was fabricated for the purpose of highlighting the foibles of, of people in power yeah. um but he had a good sense of humor that way so pivoting back to you and your arrival there on a secondary level i mean the post is and we'll move ahead here mom momentarily but i did want to backtrack to this the post is not a bad gig at all but, you know, you move with whatever circumstances are going on in your life. And if there's an opportunity for advancement or your circumstances change, you do look elsewhere. So why go to New York Newsday? Not that I'm not going to great paper when it was around. Why go there in the first place, though? Yeah, I mean, I, I had kind of, I guess, hit a plateau at the post. I was I was at police headquarters and the three other people in front of me, Murray Weiss, the bureau chief, uh, 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 Larry Salone, who had come over from the news and Phil Messing longtime veteran who retired a couple of years ago. You know, these guys were 10, 15 years, 17 years, my senior in age and in experience. And uh, I just felt I, there was not much room for advancement at the time. Um, I had also um, liked Newsday in college and I liked their, I, I liked the way they really, really covered the city. They covered the outer boroughs, you know, Bayside mar married as much to them as Midtown Manhattan, basically. And uh, and they covered issues that a lot of the other papers did not. I had tried to actually get there. Uh, I remember meeting a managing editor uh, during a summer internship I had, and you know I told him I said I'd like to come work for you when uh, when I graduate. He said, "Young man, send me your resume as soon as you get out." I sent him the resume. I'm still waiting for a response. So I, <laughs> I wanted to go to the the one paper that would have me, and it was the Post, and it was a great ride. But I always had in mind that I wanted to go back to Newsday, and and I had some friends over there who were saying, you know, we're hiring. You should you should come aboard. Um, and it was at a time when it was expanding back into the city, and so I went there in early '01, and um, the city edition again didn't last. 
but for a solid four or five years, maybe even six years, it was, you know, it was a good, it was a good ride. And then in the end, it, uh, uh, there just wasn't much room for New York city news anymore. And so I wanted to go to the news after that. And that's the paper I grew up reading. So at least should be, uh, absolutely. At least should be one of the viewers that has a question for you. And, and, and I thank her for submitting. It's a very good question. Does Rocco think journalistic integrity is the same today as it was when he started his career? If, if not, excuse me, any thought, why not? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, what we have now is we have, we have the, the conventional mainstream media that we kind of all grew up with the, the, the newspapers, the TV, uh, the local TV news, the national news. Uh, but now we have the internet and there's a lot of great journalism on the internet. But there's also a lot of subpar journalism on the internet. Sites that uh, aren't really dedicated to journalism as a craft. They're they're av they're advocacy websites, and they serve their purpose in a lot of ways. And it's in, you know their voice is important in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's not necessarily fair and balanced, if I could use that term, barring a uh, a Fox term. Mm -hmm. And then we have social media, which a lot of people confuse with media, I guess. Uh, the reporters from my generation, I mean, certainly the papers I worked at, there's, there was and is an integrity. You know, we want to get it right. You know, we want to, you know, we want, you know, we ask a thousand questions for a reason. Uh, and that's because we want to get it right. I, the, the internet and the race to get stuff online sometimes interferes with that. Uh, and, and sometimes what I don't like is we get stories up online and there's a little bit too much of a rush and we got to go back and make some changes. Now, some of it's normal particularly in police news. It's very preliminary when some, when a, a breaking news event happens, the information we're gathering, both from witnesses at the scene and from police, is often wrong. And there's no cover-up there. There's no, uh, there's no uh, ill intent. Uh, you know, police think it's this, but it's not. And they think it's this because witnesses told them that. But guess what? They were lying or they weren't really there. Well, the video that they now have shows it was different than what the witnesses said they saw because witnesses don't always see things as clearly as they think they do. So, um, so when we're, we're making, when we're making changes based on that, that's fine. But when we're getting stuff up online, that's, uh, incorrect or needs to be changed because we were rushing. That's, that could be frustrating. Yeah. You know, and it goes back to something that John Miller told me when he was on this show about the late John Timoney, uh, the former first deputy commissioner, I believe. And I'll imitate in my horrendous fashion, by the way, Timoney's Irish brogan that uh, when John had first become the DCPI in 1994, there was a police officer who was injured, but thankfully he survived the shooting. And what, what Timoney told him is the first story is never right. The second story is usually never right. And the third story is close, you know, and that's, that's pretty much an accurate assessment of these things. Sure, sure. No, no, for sure. It, 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 you know, in fact, the you know these these big cases, even like the the Harlem shooting in which Rivera and Moore were killed. That you know, a lot came out the first night, and a lot came out subsequent to that. But I still feel there's a lot about that incident that we don't know, and now we'll probably never know. Yeah. Uh, the, the gunman McNeil uh, was shot and killed, uh, and so much about him and why he why he did what he did that night is uh subject to a lot of opinion uh, but we'll never know uh and even in instances where someone like that survives you, you often don't get the full picture and what you find a lot i'm sure you can vouch for this is when you have cases that go to trial stuff comes out that you never knew right it was never revealed in the early reporting and then you have stuff that you did know that you know for a fact is right that made the newspapers back then that never get revealed at trial it may not be may not be necessary to the prosecutor's case so in the end, what you have is even in the case that goes a full trial with a, you know, a guilty or a not guilty verdict, you have a portrait that is never one hundred percent filled in. Um, and I guess if you write a book about it, you'll come a little bit closer to that. Yeah, maybe. Raquel Pranzo, who's the wife of retired NYPD Lieutenant Peter Pranzo and a frequent supporter of this show. Thank you, Rachella. She submits a question, and it's another good one. Does Rocco think newspapers in print will no longer be because of computers? You were kind of alluding to that earlier. Well, I mean, we're losing papers left and right. I mean, papers close every week in this country. Most of them are uh, weeklies uh, or, or uh, quarterlies or biweeklies, what have you. Uh, but there's been a number of dailies that have either shut or gone web only. Uh, and so it's distinctly possible. I mean, uh, you go, it's hard to find a newsstand in the city where you can buy the newspapers. Yeah. Uh, the daily news prints a lot fewer copies than it used to ditto with the post um 
Times is different in some ways. The Times is a niche paper, even though it's a it's a mainstream newspaper. Mm-hmm. It's in a league of its own in a lot of ways. It has a paywall and whatnot. They're like the journal in that regard, the Washington Post. These are the newspapers that uh, I think can better withstand the economic forces of the business um, than some of the other papers. In some ways, people see us in the Post as interchangeable. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also been a feeling, I kind of believe this, I hope it's not true, that if one of us, the Post of the News, went web only, the other one would quickly follow suit. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. There's been talk about it in recent years, but it, it still hasn't happened. So I'd like to think, I remember when I got into the business and I quickly realized, beginning in 1989, this was a business that was changing economically and not for the better. I remember saying at one point, I'd, I'd like to get to 65 and there'd still be a newspaper. And I'm closing in. <laughs> so I, I hope that's the case. And I hope this paper is, you know, 50 years after I retire, to be honest with you. I hope so too, because I'm old school. You know, even though I'm going to be 22 in a few weeks, I do like <laughs> feeling the print, you know, because that's what I grew up with. You know, we had the New Haven Register where I'm at here in New Haven, Connecticut. But even then, I've, t- I've told this story to Lupica, my late uh, abuelita, as we refer to our grandmothers in Spanish, she was the toast of the community. And she could turn a five minute trip to Sea Town to get just two things for the, for the house into a five hour one because she talked to everybody. So while she did that, You know, the newsstand was right by her. And that's where I started reading the post and the news. And I like that because some of my most prized possessions, when the Yankees won the World Series uh, in 2009, which feels like 1809 at this rate, uh, I still have the papers from that. When the Giants beat the Patriots the second time, same thing. I still have those papers downstairs safeguarded. So, you know, it's something that I want to stick around to, believe me, you're not the only one. Before I move to your stint the Daily News, and we'll hit on a few more things because I don't want to keep it more than what you have, um, 9-11. That it's you know you were a New Yorker you'd been a lifelong New Yorker by that point maybe you knew people who perished that day it's impossible if you were living in the city not to at least known if not if not knowing someone directly then knowing someone who had someone who perished that day and being an NYPD reporter thirty seven Port Authority police officers were killed and twenty three NYPD uh, officers were killed and each story is heartbreaking you know Joe Vigiano he'd been shot three times in the line of duty he returned to work each time he was killed. Uh, so ESU took a devastating hit. Um, you know, it, uh, Bill Ryan was down there. My friend, the chat, he knows uh, the bomb squad lost a member that day. So going to these funerals, hearing these stories from these widows and these families that uh, are going through not a loss where they're serving a warrant and shooting erupts and they get killed or they're on their way to a call and they get into an accident. Two towers, the tallest towers New York City had collapsing and killing them to cover something like that and to come to terms with it as a person, forget as a reporter, take me through your October, your November, your December, 2001. Sure. Well, I was, uh, I was, um, I guess, uh, seven months into my stint in Newsday. I was actually, I was actually working at night at the time. I actually started Newsday working at night. I, uh, my wife and I was splitting, uh, childcare duties. My wife had gone back to work. So I was working at night and, uh, my daughter was in school that morning and, uh, I couldn't get into the city. I tried to, but could not get, I actually had my daughter with me in an effort to take her to my wife who was then going to come home, but we got turned away and I wound up, uh, I wound up uh, going a different route and going to Newsday's office in Queens. But subsequent to that, I was, you know, down to ground zero and, um, you know, you quickly realize this is the story of a lifetime. You're not going to cover ever cover anything like this again. At least you, you hope not as a human. Uh, and I remember thinking it's just, it's just, too massive. I mean, you're just never going to get to all the angles and it's going to take years. And in fact, just uh, covering the 20 year anniversary, I I stumbled across uh, a human interest story I had never heard of back then. I had not heard about it. It was a, uh, it was the death of uh, uh, a young firefighter whose uncle happened to be um, Joe Fox, who retired a few years ago as a, as a chief from the NYPD. Uh, On the show. Yeah, and they, they hit, you know, however many weeks it was after 9-11, they still haven't recovered the body. The night of his wake, they found the body. They found the body at ground zero, and they managed uh, within the space of a couple of hours to get it to get the body to the ME, fully determine that that's the person in question because, you, you know, you got to check dental records, fingerprint records, what have you, DNA, et cetera, and then actually get him to the funeral home. Now, granted, it was 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, Everyone had gone home except his parents, Joe Fox, and some other immediate family members. And they were able to give him uh, 
you know, an emotional send off. I had, I had never heard that story before. So you learn stuff we, every time you cover these, these nine 11 events and that the 20 year anniversary one was a big one, right? we look at this in five's a big year, 10's a big year, 20, 25 will be a big year. And I was, you know, a couple of cops I spoke to, uh, in preparation for our nine 11 coverage this past September, cops crying, Joe Esposito, you know, uh, now retired, um, chief of department at the time he was in tears uh you know looking back at at that day and you know the, the, the trauma since then so um and there are still things we don't know and we're still covering uh deaths of first responders who are dying uh, from different 9 11 related cancers and uh that's not going away anytime soon as you know the numbers the number of people who died afterwards is you know is out is going to outpace ultimately the number of people who died that day. Yeah, there's one. There's many stories that stick with me. And, and Kenny Winkler, a friend of mine from the emergency service unit, who's been on the show before as part of the ESU miniseries, and he'd be if you ever talk to that guy, he, he, you're in for a great interview because uh, he saw a lot in ESU. He was there that day, and he put together the teams that went in there. And as I said earlier, ESU took a devastating hit. They lost 14 cops that day, and he sees this kid who was supposed to be on Sergeant John Coglin's team. Sergeant Coglin had gone into the South Tower, and He's like, well, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be with Sergeant Coglin. Well, this kid, his last name was McCormack. I think his name is Joseph McCormack. And his father had been shot and killed in line of duty in ESU prior in 1983, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so John sent him back, it's believed, because he, he figured, you know what? This is bad. We don't know what's going to happen. And I don't want his mom to lose his son, to lose her son, too, sure. after already having sure. lost her husband. I never knew that story until Kenny shared it. Yeah. And it, telling it now, it gives me goosebumps yeah. because he yeah. had a premonition. And that tower came down. And Coughlin, a great guy, former Marine, former housing cop before he merged with the NYPD and went to ESU, uh, was killed, sadly. So you're right. You know, in 30 years from now, 35, 50, we're still going to get those stories. Yeah, people will become more comfortable talking about it. But you're going to have people who never open up. And yeah. their, secrets are gonna, their stories are going to die with them. You know, everyone handles grief differently. Some people mm -hmm. talk about it. Other people... You know, one of the cops I interviewed for a 20-year anniversary, um, for the longest time, whenever people asked him about 9-11, and he was there that day, you know, he rushed, rushed in from Brooklyn with a van full of cops, he would refer to himself in the third person. Um, he, he, he actually believed, or he tricked himself into believing that if he talked about himself in the third person, it was almost like he wasn't there that day, at least for the purpose of getting through, explaining to the person who was asking him what it was like that day. So, yep. um um, he opened up a little bit when I spoke to him and he hadn't opened up in some time. And, and I suspect more people will open up as years go by, but there are others who just will bury that grief deep down inside and, and never really reveal, uh, all of what they saw or experienced that day. Yep. And uh, I go back to my friend last note on that Billy Ryan in the chat, who, who was there as a member of the arson explosion squad for both 1993 and 2001. He says, Mike, that day, and I know he's not in his head right now as he's listening and watching. That day was like yesterday. You know, it, it was yesterday, his exact, his exact words. And it's always going to be yesterday, end quote. And I get it. I get it. Uh, so 2009, you get to the Daily News. Now, what's interesting is you're a police bureau chief. Now, sometimes these are just fancy titles and there's really nothing special behind it. Sometimes it's very enveloping. It means what it says. Is it difficult or easy being a bureau chief given the fact that you're not only doing the reporting, but there's so many other people you have doing the same reporting under you? Yeah, I mean it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a fancy title, but it's a supervisory title, and you know what it means is I can't just concentrate on on my stories, obviously. So, um, you know, it means dealing with uh, uh, dealing with a morning assignment editor first thing in the morning. It means producing for the editors uh, no later, ideally than seven a.m. a morning note, which is sort of a jumping off point for the day, uh, and it means dealing with uh, both the reporters I work with at headquarters as well as, uh, you know, the runners out on the street, uh, going to enterprise meetings and things like that, and then dealing with uh, police officials um, um, and sort of being held responsible for everything the Daily News, good, bad, or in, good, bad, or indifferent. So, uh, but it's a great job. I wouldn't trade it for anything else. I've been at it since the summer of 09. Uh, my predecessor, Allison Jendar, did, did it for five years, and I thought that was remarkable, and she, she asked off of it because I guess... <coughs> You know, she was looking for something new. I guess she felt maybe she was starting to burn out. And I said, well, I said, that's what I have to look forward to. I'm a little worried, but 
here I am. It'll be 13 years, assuming the news still has me this August. So, um, so yeah, it's not just about it's not just about my stories. And sometimes it gets in the way because if you're working on something, you know, you got to worry about everything else at the same time. But yeah. somehow we make it work. You've written a book, as I alluded to uh, when I was introducing you. Of course, it's called "Guns and God: The Life of an NYPD Undercover," and it's about Stephen, nicknamed Stevie Gun Striker. Tell us about him, and tell us about the concept of you wanting to write a book in the first place. Yeah, Striker is not his real name. We hid his real name since he mm -hmm. was an undercover and put a lot of bad guys uh, behind bars. But um, back when Bloomberg was mayor, and uh, and uh, guns were a big issue for him, and still are, um, in, in his. Uh, uh, Post uh, post official years, he he obviously uh, is for strict gun control. Uh, he advocates in, in certain cities for strict you know for stricter gun laws. He supports candidates who support them, etc. Uh, and so our editors ordered up a three or four part series on the issue of guns in New York. And my job was to interview a, an undercover. And ultimately, it it came to be that I interviewed, I looked to interview a retired undercover because the reality was the active undercovers couldn't talk all that much about right. trade craft, about cases, because they were pending. You know, they were limited by that, and I understood that. And someone referred me to uh, Steve, who had retired not all that uh, not all that long ago prior to that, and he and I hit it off right away. I interviewed him for the purpose of the story, and that story that kicked off our coverage, that three or four days uh, uh, series. And right from when I met him, he wanted he had talked about always wanting to write a book. So, I, you know, I, I sat down with him further and I realized he had a lot of stories to tell. He's a remarkable storyteller. And I also vetted him and I realized he's, you know, for all his bravado, he's the real deal. And he wasn't lying. And, you know, people like Ray Kelly and Joseph Zito vouched for him and for what he did on the job. And so ultimately we we did this book, you know, about his life. He has a very interesting backstory. He's the son of a uh, Baptist preacher from uh, uh, a Pentecostal preacher, preacher rather from Alabama. Uh, grew up on the straight and narrow in Bushwick at a time of great strife, you know, the uh, the, the riots of the 70s and whatnot, kind of rebelled against his parents. They wanted him to go to college. He instead went into the Marines, stumbled around a little bit after that, worked in a bank, et cetera, then joined the NYPD. Why? Because he well, he joined transit. He he had the choice uh, the day of signing up to, to pick transit housing in the NYPD, and he was so impressed by Bratton and the nine millimeters. Transit had the nine millimeters then. Right. He did. He joined Transit, and he ultimately came over during the merge, and uh, he wound up being an undercover who bought both drugs and guns, which is two different skill sets. It doesn't happen often where you have an undercover dealing in both. And uh, he had a, a, a remarkable career. It was cut short by illness. He, he's not a well man. He suffers from uh, Graves, uh, Graves disease. Um, and he's relocated to Florida. Um, and he's a preacher like his dad. He became a preacher like his dad. And uh, he and I are trying to make this into a uh, his life story into a book or a TV series. So if there's anyone out there listening who has deep pockets, we're all ears. I don't have many connections yet, but, you know, the ones I do know, maybe they know people, you know. So before I uh, get the concluding segment, I do want to say transit sold uh, Limerick, and that is you ride, we hide. I love that, you know, when they are for their subway transit crime teams, um, so which has since molded now into the NYPD's transit bureau. So before I get to the concluding segment, uh, Keyshawn Sewell, interesting figure. You know, she strikes me as a very easy person to deal with, doesn't strike me as a very, you know, gruff person, like, say, for outgoing and, and uh, or not outgoing, is, is that the word I'm looking for? She doesn't strike me as a celebrity commissioner like Brad or Ray Kelly was. Not that I'm knocking them, that's just how they were. Sure. So in dealing with her, uh, what's she been like? Is my interpretation correct? Yeah, we actually have not dealt with her all that much. It's been kind of trial by fire. We've only we've seen her generally. Uh, we got to meet her the day she was announced by Eric Adams as the next commissioner, mm -hmm. and since then we've we've seen her at mostly at hospitals talking about police officers mm -hmm. being shot. We've yet to have our sort of first formal uh, police one police plaza press conference with her. I, I believe it'll it'll come soon enough. Um, but you're right. You know, she was. Uh, you know, we like to think we. You know, we know what's going on. And in all the stories talking about who the next police commissioner was, not one mentioned her as a possibility. Not one. Carmen Best was the Daily News' uh, leading candidate from Seattle. I think uh, the Post also believed her or maybe Juanita Holmes. A couple other names were thrown out there. And then all of a sudden, she gets named police commissioner. I'm like, we didn't know who she was. Um, but she's greatly credentialed. Obviously, people speak the world of her. She comes from... Uh, uh, 
most recently from the Nassau County Police Department where she was chief of detectives. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what struck me most when we met her the day that she was uh, introduced by Eric Adams was she was not overwhelmed by the moment. She was not overwhelmed by the camera. You know, on Long Island, it's Newsday and News 12 and maybe a couple other media outlets. Right. It's different in New York City. And she was uh, not intimidated at all. So um, I think she's the real deal. Um, now, time will tell uh, if if she's going to have the impact on crime that uh, I guess that the city is hoping. Yeah, it's it's funny. I didn't know this until I talked to Jack Cambria, who you probably remember as the, oh, uh, sure. the other hostage yeah. negotiation team. Jack was on the show a few weeks ago. She was a hostage negotiator. I did not know that. Yes, that's true. Yeah. She's, that a former, true. she's a former hostage negotiator. So, Rocco, this has been fun. Don't sign off yet. We'll say goodbye off the air. We got our revenge on bad technology. This redo has gone. I'm going to play the hit, huh? As both of us at, at, at Hope. But you know the segment by now because you've been on the show before. Rapid fire. Five hit and run questions from me. Five answers from you. You ready? Sure. First, funniest story you ever covered. Funniest story I ever covered. Um, Caddyshack. That was the headline in the post. It has to be maybe 92 or 93. Uh, uh, an eccentric senior citizen couple living on Sutton Place, Tony part of the uh, east side of Manhattan, not far from uh, the UN, uh, evicted from their million dollar townhouse for back rent, uh, living in their Cadillac on Sutton Place, I believe. Hoping to get back in, never actually getting back in. Well, there you go. Caddyshack is the right headline to roll with that, only in New York. Second funniest colleagues you ever worked with, and you can't say Lenny. How many colleagues ever worked with? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, Charlie Carrillo, uh, columnist at the New York Post, um, later went into television, and Bill Hoffman, a longtime rewrite guy at the New York Post. They both had a, a tabloid sense of humor uh, that infected their writing, and I mean that in the best way possible, mm -hmm. and also sort of became their personality. Uh, and they were, they were fun to be around. I also learned a lot from them. Third, best advice anyone ever gave you? Uh, journalistically, um, probably not to assume anything. You know, it's easy to assume that this shooting means this about the people involved or that, uh, this incident is an example of A, B, and C, you know, whatever the case might be. Uh, but I find that every story is a little bit different. And the minute you make an assumption about a, a person, a position, a neighborhood, uh, your story suffers. And the old saying, I'll clean it up a little bit for the show since I like to keep it G-rated. And you know what I'm going to say. Assume To assume makes a bleep out of you and me. That so is absolutely correct. Yep. Absolutely correct. Fourth, favorite bar or restaurant in New York City? Well, I'm going to have to go with the Lion's Head, the now defunct Lion's Head, which was a famous bar in the village where um, reporters used to gather and have drinks. And for the New York Post, for whatever reason, Monday night was on night. So that uh, you know, the food wasn't very good. It was bar food, but it was a fun <laughs> place to be. Fifth and finally, what advice would you give anyone looking to enter your profession? Uh, work, you know, just absolutely work. Find a job somewhere. It could be a weekly. It could be a website. It could be an assistant somewhere. But just actually, you actually have to get out and do the reporting. And uh, the old saying, knock on doors and uh, and talk to people on the street. It's, it's it's as true now as it was then. We've gotten a little bit away from that with smaller staffs. A lot more of it is phone work or emails and things like that. But the, the way to get to the heart of the story is to is to is to talk to the people most involved. And sometimes that means, you know, you got to get on a train or drive somewhere and wait until someone gets home or, or wait outside an office till someone's done that day if they're dodging you, let's say, and, and try to get to the heart of the matter. There you go. Any shout outs you want to give before we go? No, I just want to thank you for uh, giving me another shot. I know so, uh, you, you, you were too kind. I think actually the problem was on my end with the technology last time. So thank you for that. Oh, no problem. You were a great guest, and I'm glad that we could do this again and do it right this time. Uh, my shout-out, as always, to you, the audience. Let me shout-out our friends in the live chat here. Like I said, Joe Connor, the Pranzos, and uh, Raquel and Peter, uh, Billy Ryan, of course, Arson Explosion Squad, retired detective first grade, Dawn Marie, Alicia B., Ruth Ann Griffin, uh, Maui Swift, and just make sure I don't miss anybody, retired NYPD first grade detective Christian Flood from the hostage negotiation team. Thank you, buddy, for being here and supporting the show. Coming up next in the Mike Dinwaven podcast, Friday, he survived the Larry Davis shootout. He was right there in the thick of it as a member of Truck 3 in the emergency service unit. His name's Rick Martinez, and he'll be here for the miniseries that we have, The E-Men, inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. This is going to be Volume 7. Rocco, like I said, stick around. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. In the meantime, on behalf of Rocco Paris Game, I am Mike Cologne, and we will see you 
next time. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Have a great night. Good night. Mm-hmm.